Hi, I'm Tracy Borman. I'm an author, Tudor historian and broadcaster. And I'm very lucky because uh, I work for Historic Royal Palaces, which means that my office is Henry VIII's Palace, Hampton Court. That's right. This month, we're celebrating Elizabeth I. And who better to join our celebration than internationally celebrated historian, author, and broadcaster, Dr. Tracy Borman. Dr. Borman is credited with humanizing the Tudors as she shares such details in her books as Henry VIII's love of puddings and Elizabeth I's invention of her own perfume. Her nonfiction recreates and brings to life the famous figures of the Tudor dynasty. And her new fiction trilogy is described as, quote, luring readers into the world of Stuart England through the story of Lady Frances with effortless storytelling and vivid details. Tracy's been seen on numerous historic programs, and she is the joint chief curator of historic royal palaces. It's a thrill to have Tracy join us to talk about her early interest in Elizabeth, the wonderful places her scholarship has taken her, and her thoughts about how Elizabeth became such a success and icon of the Tudor age. She'll also share some experiences with the tangible artifacts of history, including a certain ring I can't stop thinking about. So many thanks to Tracy Borman for joining us. Tracy Borman, for joining me on the podcast to celebrate Elizabeth I, one of our favorite tutors, although we love them all, but she is a special figure. And so I wanted to start by asking, what is it about Elizabeth I that you find so captivating and that just lights us all up so much, do you think? Mm -hmm. I think you were quite right to use the word celebrate uh, because I absolutely love Elizabeth. She is worth celebrating every day of the year, in my opinion. Um, So my love for Elizabeth really began when I was um, about 16 and I was studying uh, for A-levels, we call them over in the UK. Um, And it was my history teacher who was incredibly inspiring. She was a Tudor enthusiast and she just put the kind of replica portraits all the way around the classroom, all these Holbeins, all these amazing portraits of Elizabeth. And it just lit um, a spark for me. Um, and uh, that that spark has grown into a sort of all-consuming fire over the years that have followed. Um, but Elizabeth in particular, so I, I, of course I love the Tudors. I just love the whole period. But Elizabeth, I just so admire her. I mean, what an incredible woman. She confounded the stereotypes of uh, female rulers or women in general. They were seen as second-class citizens, not really capable of doing anything uh, without the guidance um, of a man. Uh, but Elizabeth, you know, she famously said, I will have but one mistress here and no master. She was going to rule alone, unmarried. This was deeply shocking, deeply unconventional. And she proved everyone wrong. Um, She made herself really, I think, the most successful of all the Tudors um, and made a lot of sacrifices along the way. She ruled with the head, not with the heart. Um, so I have huge, huge admiration. She's my all-time historical heroine. Oh, that's that's fabulous. And I absolutely agree. So this is wonderful. <laughs> so she certainly had a challenging childhood. So mm. both Mary and Edward had their moments. Now, Mary certainly had challenges, but those first years of Mary's life, she was the fetid princess And then, of course, Edward was always the man of the hour, the little boy of the hour. But Elizabeth Mm. had a lot of challenges. And then after her father died during both Edward's and Mary's reigns, also a lot of challenges. So what do you think gave her the confidence to believe she could rule? I think, um, I mean, you've hit upon one of the, I think, the key ingredients for Elizabeth's success is the fact she did have this really turbulent 
childhood. She didn't have it easy. She wasn't born to expect to rule, to be a, a queen regnant one day, unlike Mary, Queen of Scots, um, and who was kind of raised this pampered princess, really, um, and uh, and actually made a complete disaster of, of ruling uh, Scotland. Um, uh, you're right, Elizabeth's sister Mary um, had her moments. It wasn't easy for her. But I think for Elizabeth, as, as not just a girl, but a younger girl, a younger daughter, she had really no hope of inheriting the throne. And then she had to battle with being made illegitimate when uh, her mother Anne Boleyn was executed and, and their marriage was declared null and void. So, you know, she was so far down the bottom of the pile. You know, nobody would have put money on Elizabeth being Queen of England one day. But she learned the hard way and she saw what went wrong when you love, when you mix love with politics. Um, so in the case of her mother, obviously, that didn't turn out too well. Anne Boleyn and Henry VIII, very tempestuous and kind of ultimately uh, fatal uh, relationship between them. But also Elizabeth um, watched what happened with her half-sister Mary and, and her marriage to Philip of Spain and what a disaster that was in terms of alienating most of uh, Mary's subjects who didn't want the King of Spain over here to lord it over them. Um, and then, of course, there were the, the examples of Elizabeth's stepmothers, Catherine Howard, executed. Um, Catherine Parr, um, she learned a lot from uh, as to how to rule, how to wield authority. But then ultimately, she also saw Catherine Parr ill-treated by a man, her uh, husband, Thomas Seymour, uh, who kind of really flirted with Elizabeth herself. So Elizabeth didn't have any positive role models for uh, marriage. And, and I think this was so influential on her outlook as queen. And you can argue it gave her her finest hour because if she hadn't decided to be a virgin queen, if she'd been deeply conventional like her half-sister Mary and just uh, as a first priority sought a husband, I don't think she would have been the success story that she turned out to be. Oh, that's a great point, because if she'd played by the male rules, she might not have shown in the way she did or made her own place in the world. And that quotation about, but one mistress and no master, so to me embodies how she was able to succeed. Mm, me too. And she wasn't going to give any power away to a man. She had fought her way to that throne. It had been one of the most tortuous paths to the royal throne in British history. Um, and uh, there's no way she was she knew the risks of, of marriage. She knew that convention dictated she would have to give up her authority to her husband whether he was a foreigner or a, a homegrown candidate uh, and she wasn't having it and I don't blame her right and I wonder too I mean as you were saying that I was thinking in both Edward's reign and Mary's reign when Elizabeth was under suspicion and under investigation and she really had to take care of herself and rely mm. on herself and I just think that might, you know, have really stuck with her that that's who she could trust was herself. Absolutely. She couldn't really trust anybody else. She couldn't trust the men in her life, certainly. Right. Um, and yeah, she became very self-reliant and also incredibly resilient. I think, you know, a, yes. a turbulent childhood, the sorts of things that Elizabeth suffered, her her mother being executed at her father's orders. Can you imagine a modern day psychotherapist, what they would make of that? But, but it sort of chiseled Elizabeth into this, into this fearsome woman, into this very resilient woman. Um, and she knew from a very early age that the only person she could depend on was herself. And I think that was her strength and that was her inspiration going forward. She never really trusted anyone completely, even close advisors such as, as Burley in later years, I think. Right. And that, and that brings me to a point because I know that Burley um, was very important to her and was her first choice as an advisor, counselor, sort of. On, he had a, a couple of different titles, but he seemed to fill a similar role always. So when I think about Henry VIII 
and he sort of went through Wilsey and then Cromwell and was sort of <laughs> changing people. But Elizabeth did have William Cecil for that long, long period of time. And then his son at the end. So in addition to other advisors, but what kind of difference do you think there was an advantage of having Cecil for pretty much her whole reign and then another Cecil for the final years of her reign? Did that continuity help? Yeah, I think it really helped. I think that the keynote of Elizabeth's reign was stability. Um, You know, perhaps it's going too far to say it was this sort of flawless golden age. There were problems, there were difficulties. Elizabeth wasn't perfect, but what she brought England was much needed stability for um, four and a half decades after the most turbulent half century, uh, really, in one of the most in Mm -hmm. British um, royal history. And, And having that continuity of advisors and as well as Burley and his son Robert Cecil who you mentioned of course Walsingham her great spy master he was there a long time and and it was the same in Elizabeth's private world um, when she found ladies who she could uh, trust more than most she kept them with her Blanche Parry her childhood nurse uh, was with her throughout her life. She died in service as an 80-odd-year-old woman. She could hardly see, but she was still in service to Elizabeth. And that sense of continuity and stability, I think, was part of Elizabeth's genius as queen. That's that's wonderful. And I also am reminded of a conversation I had. I'm Uh, a speaker at the Smithsonian. So I talk about Elizabeth sometimes here in DC and now actually online. But one of the questions somebody asked when we'd had a discussion about the um, Babington plot and Mm. all of the things that were going on, it was just really such an amazing time. And the question I thought was so interesting was, how was Elizabeth able to keep in particular Cecil and Walsingham during that period of time loyal to her? How was it with all of the funds that Philip of Spain or the Pope may have been willing to spend to get these men, these key figures on their side? How was it that she was able to inspire that kind of loyalty? So you have the continuity in the government and you have the continuity with some of the women who are closer to her, like Blanche Perry, who really are just put everything else aside for her how do you think she did inspire that loyalty yeah um and there's no doubt that she that she did and i think the simple answer where burley and walsing were concerned is is that you know she was a protestant figurehead they were protestants Mm -hmm. they despised uh the the catholic religion and and the catholic plotters and their loyalties uh, from a religious point of view were firmly aligned with elizabeth but it goes much deeper than that i think she was a woman who just inspired loyalty um because you know blanche parry I'd, i'm not sure that mm-hmm. religion mattered all that much to blanche parry but she would have died for elizabeth and i think the key ingredient was if these advisors and Burley is one of these had served Elizabeth when she was a princess, when she didn't know that she was mm-hmm. going to be queen, they stuck with her. They saw that there was just something in Elizabeth that is worth fighting for, that's worth staying with her. I think um, they admired her discipline, her courage. Uh, she put her country ahead of everything else. And she was... You know, in the early years as as a princess, she was the underdog. And and I think um, even so, she had this steely core that we um, spoke about. She developed this resilience and this belief in herself. And I think that made her a very inspirational figure to those who served her. And they did stay with her till the end. And I can't imagine a scenario that would have tempted the likes of Burley or or Parry or Walsingham away from their beloved mistress. That's true. And that's a side of her we don't always think about, but that's right. The level of loyalty and dedication is something that certainly in earlier, not too long ago eras, we do see betrayals. I'm thinking of, you know, the kingmaker who just decides, well, I'll change sides here. Um, so it doesn't always end up that way, but yeah. she really did inspire that loyalty. And that's, um, 
That's great. So we've talked a little bit about her not marrying and she was quite effective in sort of cajoling parliament early on. Well, of course I'll get married kind of thing. And Mm -hmm. also at the same time would often say, nope, not going to happen. So realizing that there are problems associated either with a foreign prince or with an Englishman, do you think there was ever really a good option for her to marry? Mm -hmm. And how do you think she sort of debated that within herself? And I know we can't really know how she debated something yeah. within herself, but the trade-off of course, is if she does not have her own child, then the dynasty comes to an end. So. Yeah, yeah absolutely. I think um, really Elizabeth never seriously contemplated marriage. Uh, she gave the appearance of it. Um, she gave uh, what was <laughs> referred to brilliantly as answers answerless. Um, she was just brilliant at doing that, kind of giving these vague promises, but actually uh, nothing concrete behind it. And and j- but just enough, uh, kind of tantalising. Will she maybe <laughs> to keep all of these various suitors in play? And that's what she intended. And I think a, really a masterstroke of Elizabeth is that she knew that that her male courtiers her male peers in in Europe saw her as this heretical freak of nature she's this woman who's not married and she's ruling a country you know she shouldn't be there and rather than kind of rail against that she pretended to agree with them you know she is just but a weak and feeble woman and she made the most of those feminine weaknesses as they were seen um so in order to get her way so when pressured to make decisions about marriage uh she would say well you know i'm just a woman how can you expect me to make a decision you know and i think that was just brilliant because it sort of serves them right this is that she's absolutely in in appearance conforming to a stereotypical woman who just can't make her mind up who doesn't know how to act without a man i think at heart elizabeth knew exactly what she was doing she realized that actually there just wasn't a viable candidate if you marry a foreign suitor her sister has proved what happens there you know it's a disaster if you marry a homegrown candidate it's no more easy um it's still fraught with difficulty because it will be you know a surefire way uh, to create resentment to create factions rebellion within your kingdom if you favor one man above all others so she knows you know who is she going to choose uh, she has to just really choose herself and marry england as she makes this brilliant kind of uh, imagery around this you know i am i'm married to england my people are my children she is a mistress of PR. She is absolutely brilliant at it. Um, And so I I do think it was a masterstroke not to marry. But of course, as you say, the payoff is no heir, no direct successor. And that is where the plan does fall down a bit. That is the price that she has to pay. This instability, which gets greater as the rain goes on, and more and more people are, are starting to feel uncertain and, and what's going to happen. And I think actually, even though I say as the rain goes on, you know, that's with hindsight because we know she she was the longest reigning Tudor. But actually, nobody expected her to survive. She almost died four years into being queen. There were constantly these plots and assassination attempts. Um, so she lived against the odds and, and therefore the, the succession was always an issue throughout the reign. Um, and, and that was the price, really, that she had to pay for, for making this decision not to marry. Right. That's that's right. Because when she, yes, when she caught smallpox or there were many assassination attempts, the reign could have ended at any time very abruptly. Mm-hmm. And she never really named an heir. So there was always this succession potential crisis. And it was Almost, I sometimes think she just, through her own force of will, stayed alive, which is quite yes. remarkable. Yes, and then at the end decides to die. Um, you know, uh-huh. wonderful descriptions of her sort of final days at Richmond, where it's almost like she's decided, okay, I know I'm losing my grip. Um, 
my uh, you know physical capacity and mental capacity isn't quite what it was now's the time to die i'm not going to eat i'm not going to drink i'm not going to mm-hmm. go to bed i'm going to fundamentally weaken myself and hasten my end uh, so you know and one of her courtiers said she's mistress of her own fate all the way up to the end right and that's just you know if i can't be at 100% then you're not getting pieces of me Yes. So it's, <laughs> it is kind of marvelous um, to think of that. So yes, in, in full control. So, yes. so speaking of full control um, and her own questions about, you know, not marrying and the reason she didn't marry, I wonder if um, you could speak a little bit about her ladies. And although there were a few where she supported their marriages for the most part, mm-hmm. And perhaps it's Blanche Perry in this beautiful image of someone who never married. And so Elizabeth was the person in her life. But she didn't seem to like it when her other ladies-in-waiting, the women around her, got married. So why do you think that was? You're right. She didn't like it. And and that's putting it mildly. Um, (laughs) I think probably Blanche Parry has a bit to answer for this because she set the benchmark of what Elizabeth expected. So she's one of Elizabeth's earliest attendants. She devotes her life to Elizabeth's service. She doesn't marry. She doesn't pursue her own personal happiness. All of her happiness and her fulfillment is in service to Elizabeth. Now, that makes Elizabeth uh, raise the bar pretty high because um, she wants every other woman to uh, who serves her to act like Blanche. So she, you sense Elizabeth's kind of being, you know, affronted and disappointed if her ladies want to have a bit of a life of their own and, and marry. And she sees that as very disloyal. Um, so she does hate it. I think as well, it's always dangerous to layer on modern psychology, but I think there's a bit of jealousy at play here as well. Elizabeth has given up everything, her own sort of personal desires in order to serve her country as she sees fit. Um, I think there's no doubt Elizabeth loved Robert Dudley, Earl of Leicester. Um, I think it was a meeting of minds. I think they were kind of soulmates, really. Theirs was a a 50-year relationship uh, in whatever form it took. Um, I think if she had been just an ordinary woman, she would have married him like a shot. Um, But she didn't. She she gave up, um, as I say, her personal happiness fulfillment for her country so I can kind of understand why she would be a bit resentful about her ladies you know following their own desires as well as getting to do their day job because that's not something that was open to her that's great and and Blanche Perry did that as well and as you say that's a pretty high bar for anyone (laughs) to ever live up to it really is I mean who's going to do that And, and the difficulty is that Um, these ladies were in a catch-22 situation. Uh, If they asked permission, nine times out of 10, it would be refused. So what they did was to go behind Elizabeth's back, marry in secret or have um, clandestine affairs. um, One, you know, more than one account of of a lady in waiting falling pregnant and actually giving Mm -hmm. birth while in service, trying to keep it secret. And then, of course, Elizabeth was furious. But you think, well, what do they do? Do they just um, kind of abide by her stricture and give up their own happiness or or do they just risk it and, and, and risk her favor and sometimes, you know, catastrophically? Um, in the case of the likes of, you know, Beth Throckmorton, who married uh, Sir Walter Raleigh, um, Elizabeth's great favourites. But my favourite of the ladies-in-waiting is Helena Snackenborg, a gloriously named Swedish lady-in-waiting, who absolutely adored Elizabeth and the feeling was mutual. But she fell in love with a fairly low-ranking courtier who she knew Elizabeth wouldn't approve of. So they married without permission. But Elizabeth loved Helena so much that she forgave them. And she even gave them uh, a a wrecked armada ship as a wedding present, uh, (laughs) which was actually worth quite a lot because there was quite a lot of treasure on board. (laughs) Oh, that's great. I had not known the detail of that being the wedding present. That's a wonderful (laughs) little detail. Hard to gift wrap. (laughs) Right. Not on your wedding registry, but I've come up with something quite special. Well, and that is an example of someone that where her love sort of overshadowed her jealousy to have all of the attention Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. And uh, yeah, that's a great, that's a great example because it didn't happen very often. And Beth Throckmorton is an example of someone who did not um, do well when that marriage yeah. came to light. I mean, it yeah. was difficult, very difficult. It, it didn't, it didn't go well really um, for Bess or ultimately for Raleigh. Um, right. But, but yeah, Elizabeth was capable of, of strong abiding affection towards her women. Uh, you know, she's portrayed as a, a man's woman because uh, she's this great flirt. She loved to be the queen bee in the hive. But that's not the full picture. You know, she had really close relationships with her women and and those that were she trusted most and she loved most, she did forgive and she did allow right. to have a bit of their own lives as well. And that brings us to the end of part one of my interview with the wonderful Dr. Tracy Borman. It's great to be reminded that Queen Elizabeth did have strong relationships with the women in her life. In fact, there will be more of that in part two. Come back next week to hear about Elizabeth's relationship with two very important women, Anne Boleyn and Anne of Cleves. I'm so excited. There's more to come. Thank you for listening. I hope you've enjoyed this time with the royals, rebels, and romantics of British history, especially Queen Elizabeth I. I really love hearing from you. So let me know what you think. Give the podcast a rating and please reach out on social media at Shake Up History on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. And now stay safe, have a good week, and let's keep shaking up history together. Music.